to get a handle on yourself. Today we're talking about handling yourself. If you didn't get a chance to see it, I put it out there on the social media world. Uh, yesterday we had the chance to go see BJ Thomas in concert. Uh, yeah, and it was great. Uh, and so if you haven't seen it, I put it out there on uh, Instagram and on our Facebook page. And of course, my mom and dad and their friend Sandy. Sandy came from Alabama to Georgia to come over to East Georgia so she could go to Wiley Church and catch BJ on the way through. And so, uh, she, and so uh, they have come, and don't ask me how, but they are friends to BJ Thomas. And so when we got done, we had the chance to go back and meet with him and talk with him for a few minutes. And so if you get out there, I'll email it in the link this week, that, uh, the link if you hadn't seen it. But um, we had a chance to actually get to talk to him. He's five Grammy winner, Grammy Hall of Famer, won two double awards. Uh, won a double award for Amazing Grace one year, won another double award um, for uh, Home Where I Belong. He has made a lot of... Uh, great accomplishments. If you don't know, if all of you millennials are one step behind millennials, he sang the thing to grow in pains when you were in the 80s. Uh, he showed me that's my, you got it, that's it, you know it. You're like, oh, that guy. And uh, he's raindrops falling on your head for the rest of you. So we had a great time to see those. So I just wanted to make sure you uh, uh, check that out, but let my family know you're glad they're here too. Amen. Amen. So let's go back to handling ourselves. I need to handle, get a handle on myself here. So today we're going to look at Acts chapter 26. Paul is our key example. In the book of Acts, we have witnessed the journey of Paul's conversion from Acts chapter 9. That was where he was Saul. We're just going to call him Paul because that's his name that the Lord left him with. And he is our key example. When we look at Paul's life, he battled what many of us battled. Paul had a past. He thought was probably greater than it could be, than anyone could be to be used. Maybe you'd say, things I've done have disqualified me, and I don't know how to handle myself. I feel like God can only use me up to second class, but God is not going to use me to first class based on the things that have been part of my past. But the good thing about Paul is Paul didn't sit and live in adversity towards what he had done in his life. Paul seemed that he would have a past that was too great to move forward, but what he actually did was the way he handled himself was he actually decided that he was not going to hide the things that he had been through. Matter of fact, many of you can think about the things that you have gone through maybe when you were younger, maybe last week, and if I ask you, tell me about yourself, you're like, you don't want to know about me. You don't want to know what I've done. You don't want to know what I've been through. And when we start out off the journey like that, then we automatically feel ashamed for where we were and where we are or where we've been. And the Lord is wanting us to move past that and get a handle on our past. And, and that's what Paul did. Matter of fact, whenever Paul was in Acts 26, he was making his case before King Agrippa. And he's retelling the story again about his conversion and what happened. He didn't say, well, I did some things I ain't proud of. He said, let me tell you what I used to think I was, and then let me tell you about Jesus. Now, if he had stood before the king and just owned to his past and stuck to his past, he could have got off. But he knew when he confessed guilty to all the things that he had did once he hit conversion, he knew that he could inevitably die for this. But Paul was not afraid of his past. Paul was not afraid of what God had done for him. He embraced it. And so Acts 26, starting in verse 4, this is what we see. The Bible says that the Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child. This is his speech to Agrippa. He says, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem, they've also known me for a long time and they can testify if they're willing that I conform to the strictest sect of the religion, living as a Pharisee. He said, listen, I was bad. I was doing what the world wanted me to do, but I was not doing what Christ was wanting me to do. And instead of just saying, I'm a Christian, forget that, he recognized his past. Even in verse 9, it says to us, he says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that's possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So Paul is embracing what happened to his past because he knew that God could use the things behind him for the glory of God today. 
And I want to submit to you today that everything you went through in your life, everything you've gone through, the things that hurt the most are still the things that God is going to get the glory out of. And if you can trust God to get the glory out of your past, because let me be honest with you, nobody wants to go through pain without purpose. I can handle the pain if there's a purpose. I can put up with it. A childbirth comes with great pain, but what a great price. Whenever you see different things, you know, there are, there are things we give sacrificially, but then when you see the joy on someone's face when you can help them through something. Pain is okay if it has purpose. The enemy wants you to die with pain. And God is saying, I can bring purpose to the things you've gone through in your life. And that's where we are today. So if we're going to get a handle on ourselves, the first thing we got to do is, number one, we have got to leverage our past. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you. Just want to make sure you knew who I was talking to. What Paul did, as Saul rather, he expressed in his speech to Agrippa his dependence on his own abilities. I was a Pharisee. I wasn't just a Pharisee. I was the man. I knew the language. I came from good family. I was a Roman citizen. He named everything that would help him in the line of the Pharisee work. And, and, and he had all the things to talk about. Matter of fact, even a, we think to ourselves, I don't have a colorful past like that. Even a non-past is still a past. You may not have went out. The old saying is, I don't drink, smoke, and chew, and I don't go with girls that do. And, and, and uh, and uh, maybe that's the way you were brought up, or maybe that's the way it was told. But maybe your past isn't like that. Now, I didn't have trouble with, with, with the blanket sins. My trouble came in self-righteousness. My trouble came in, I, I, I knew that God saves us all, but because I grew up in church, I still thought I was a little better than some of you. And that was what happened. I had a little Pharisee, and it's okay. I had a procedure done. It's called a Pharisectomy. And, 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 and they just they cut the Pharisee. They had to cut the Pharisee right out. I got a little scar. The catheter on my side was brutal. It's okay. It's all right. I, after I got rid of the bag, it was fine. But what we have here is the Pharisectomy had to be taken off of me because even though I may not have did what the world classified as sin, I had found myself with a non-pass. I found myself still judging like I thought I was in charge, and I found myself making my way I did my own God instead of letting God be my God. And I want you to know this morning that if you're going to be an overcomer, you've got to be able to leverage the things that you've gone through in your life for the glory and the honor of God. If you want your past to have purpose, say amen. Amen. One of the greatest enemies of our future is our past. Because how many times have you started to want to do something for the Lord? Or, or maybe you said, I'm going to put myself out there. I don't know where out there is, but we put ourselves there. And when we get out there, we are now standing vulnerable. Because Satan wants us to be hidden. Jesus wants us to come forward. And the only way we can get out to get God get the glory in our life is if we get out there. Are you willing to go out there? Out there is the place of vulnerability. And the problem with out there is Satan loves to dance in front of you. And he loves to sit and tell you, you know what? You're not good enough. You know what? You're not going to overcome this. You may think you're supposed to do this, but I want you to know, I know where you came from. How many people like to call you out by where you came from? Even Jesus had to deal with that. Here he was. And they said, listen, who do you think you are? Isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? Who does he think he is? I want you to know this morning that if you will trust the Lord completely, he can leverage your past and what you feel is your obstacle that you will never get over will actually be the platform that God will take you to where he wants you to go. Paul knows that when he stood before Agrippa, he clarified what his past was, but not only did he do that, the reason he did was so that he could declare what his future is. You can clarify where you've been and then you can declare where God is taking you. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel better when I know that God is okay that I got a pass. Look at your neighbor and say, you got a pass. 
Tell the person three pews behind you, say, you up to something before? You've been up to something before. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> Paul moves from clarifying his past to declaring his present and his future. Here, here's, here's an example of what he did. If you look in verse 12 of 26, it says, on one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commissions of the chief priest. And about noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. And we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And what happened for Paul was he had an encounter with God and he had an encounter with Jesus. And if you want to use your past for the glory of God, you're going to have to, the only way you can do it and to leverage your past is have an encounter with God and with Jesus himself. It's got to be a life altering moment. Our past, matter of fact, here's a good one. Overcoming our past begins with a life altering moment. And that is when we realize we have not been living at the moment to please God. When you realize that, your life will change. If you don't think you've done anything wrong, if you don't think you've got a reason to be forgiven... Then you'll just, you'll just hang out there. But, but if I'm going to make a difference and if my past is going to get glory to God for it, if I'm going to get purpose in my pain, i got to be willing to own what it is and be ready to move forward. I don't know about you, but I don't want to lie to anybody anymore. You ever wanted to slap Christians? I'm just saying. Because I've seen people in my lifetime over the years, and you've seen them too, that you thought they must have never had a day wrong in their life. They were born in a cathedral, <laughs> lived every day in church. They might have ate church, got hot dogs when they were little, cut their teeth on the pew. You know, we've got to be careful how we raise kids in church because a lot of times... We can forget to tell them why we do what we do. One kid went to a really large church and they had a lot of older people and so they kept having funerals and so they kept going to the funeral. And as a matter of fact, the seven-year-old finally said, Grandma, how come they bring a dead body in here every three weeks? <laughs> he didn't know. He was just seven years old. What's up with the man in the box? She said, you just be quiet. He's in a better place. I said, how big was his last box? <laughs> Matter of fact, the preacher would be up there and he'd be saying, this man's with the king. And then when you're seven years old, you know what that means? You have to go to the kids' choir. Anybody got forced? To, you went to the kids' choir because it was required. You just went. <laughs> and then they get the kids' choir and they make you sing a song. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. <laughs> I want to see the king, Grandma. <laughs> Grandma. And we've got to be careful because, I mean, some of us, we've had the privilege of being raised in church all our life. But whether you were raised in church all our life, you still go through stuff. And if we are willing to admit that we've been through stuff, we'll never learn from it. And matter of fact, we'd see people, they say, well, I've never had an argument with my wife in 42 years. You're a liar. And, and, uh, and, because it doesn't work that way. But I'm here to tell you, if you can own what your life really looks like, if you can own your past, then God can leverage the problems you've been through to put you in the place of victory that He wants you to be. Are you willing to let the things of your past be able to pave the way for what God has for your future? Say amen. All right. The second thing we got to do, we don't leverage our past alone, but we also we have to lead with faith. Leading with faith has everything to do with this question. This is sobering. This is how you know you're leading with faith. When you can ask this question and answer it honestly. And this is what it means to lead with faith. Do I trust God more than I trust myself? Do I trust God and His plan more than I trust my own? Do I trust God that He'll come through even though I don't feel He will? Because our emotions will lead us in directions that we were never meant to go. Matter of fact, we say things that are so stupid. <laughs> Follow your heart. 
Trust your heart. Your heart will never leave you wrong. That might work in a love song. It might work in a country song. It might work in a somebody done somebody wrong song. <laughs> but it doesn't work in life. Jeremiah says that your heart will deceive you. And what happens is when we move on our emotions, we ride the roller coaster. But the Bible teaches us that to have faith in God, it is forcing the emotions we feel to be in subjection to the word we read and to the God we serve. And I know it doesn't seem like we can do it, but I'm here to tell you it's time to lead with faith. And when you walk in faith, you start speaking a language that the world thinks you're crazy. They'll start saying that you're like, they're coming to get your house tomorrow. Well, they can come, but God's still going to get the glory in my life. The doctor said you're terminal. My God says he's my healer. Everybody says you're never going to get out of this. I'm here to tell you the Lord's going to set me free. Faith talks a language that the world thinks is crazy, but the language that God wants us to speak is the language of heaven, not the language of the world. I know that everybody seems that everybody's getting but what I'm here to tell you this morning is we got to speak the language of faith. I want you to have so much faith, everybody that didn't say thinks you're crazy. I want them to say, how do you believe it's going to work out? I know it will. How do you know? God said it. Show me how he said it. His word says he'll never leave me or forsake me. His word says he's never going to put on me anything I can't handle. His word says I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. His word says he gives life to the dead and calls the things that are not as though they are. His word says though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. His rod and his staff, they come for me. How do I know I'll be healed? His word said in Psalm 107, I sent my word and healed them. How do I know that I can be delivered from my sickness? Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes we are healed. How you know it's really going to happen. Peter put it in past tense. First Peter 2 24 said by his stripes we were healed. The healing took place on the cross and with our faith can believe it then the Lord can manifest it. He won't do for you what you don't believe he's going to do for you. And I got good news for you. God blesses people that believe him. And he doesn't bless them if they don't believe him. Because that's what we do, is have faith. Number three, we have to be able to learn teachability. Boy, that's a big one. We have to leverage our past. We've got to lead with our faith. We've got to learn teachability. And I want you to know this. Being teachable is a choice. It's not something you're born with. Being teachable is I choose to not be stubborn. I choose to not just sit and soak and sour. Being teachable forces us to be able to say this question. Can you say this? I'm willing to own my faults and allow Christ to change my thoughts and actions. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be able to say, I was wrong? Are you able to say, I messed up? Are you able to say to somebody, I forgive you? If we learn to forgive people, we're teachable. If we learn to ask for forgiveness and change, we're teachable. If we don't practice teachability, we will never go any further in our relationship with God. And finally, number four, you got to leverage your past. You've got to listen to his voice. What was the big defining moment for Paul? He tells the story to Agrippa of what happened in Acts chapter 9. He tells them about the time that he was on his way to persecute and kill more Christians. But Paul surrendered when he heard the voice of God. 
he heard Jesus say, why do you persecute me? I like what Paul said by Saul. We'll call him Saul for now. I like what Saul said. He said, who are you, Lord? And I like how he goes ahead and answers it. He knew he was in the presence of God Almighty. He said, why do you persecute me? And then after he gets off, if you go a few more verses down, you know what he says to him? He says, Paul, get up. And that's what he's saying to us today. His voice is telling you today, get up. Get up and let's get going. You need to get a handle on yourself. You need to get a handle on yourself. And the way you do that as a Christian is you have to follow the scriptural steps and you have to be willing to listen to the voice of God. Are you willing to follow His voice? You can be inspired and still not changed. You can be moved and still not discipled. You can feel goosebumps and still not do anything about the things you're wrestling with. And God is telling us if we're going to get a handle on ourselves, we have to be able to, willing to follow His voice. And how do you hear the voice of God? Maybe you're saying, I've been in a dark place. I can't hear God. I don't know. What, what do you mean hear God? How do I hear God? There are ways that we can hear Him. And here's how we look to do that. He speaks, number one, through His Word. And then what does He do? He confirms it through prayer. And then number three, He reveals by Holy Spirit what He's saying to you. Now let me unpack that for just a moment. He speaks primarily through His Word. Say amen. Okay, and, and then he confirms through prayer. Why does he confirm through prayer? Because some people go to God in prayer, but they haven't spent time with God in the Word. And so they start praying things that are against God's Word. And God does not answer prayers that are counter, uh, counter to His Word. So if you want to get God to move and do something, you've got to be willing to pray a prayer that is in line with the Word of God. And then He reveals things by the Holy Spirit. How many of you believe the Holy Spirit still reveals things? Say amen. I believe the Holy Spirit does too. But the Holy Spirit will not reveal anything to you that is not in line with the Word. If somebody walks into your midst and tells you that the Holy Spirit told them to do this, but is against what the Word of God says, you need to back away slowly or turn tail and run. It don't matter, but they're not there giving you what the Word says. God's Word always brings it back to what He has promised by His Spirit. And so when somebody speaks to you and they tell you, thus saith the Lord, you take it and hold it, but you make sure everything they said lines up to the Word. And then you do like James says, you test that Spirit to see if it's from Satan the human spirit or from God. And then you, you'll be able to hear. So he speaks through the word. We learn how to pray the word. And that will help confirm through prayer. I've had people pray for all kinds of weird things. Lord, please let my husband leave me. That's not going to work. So that's not what God designed. Lord, please let my... I better not say it. But I'm going to tell you, people pray for a lot of weird things. We got to be willing to listen to the voice of God if we're going to see it through. So here's the takeaway. This is where we bring it down to tonight. You can come to the music. There are three things I'm going to tell you right now that will help you if you will trust God in this right now. Are you ready? First thing we got to recognize as we get ready for the altar is number one, handling myself correctly is lived out in my trust in God's plan over my plan. God, I don't understand. But I'm trusting you. Leading with faith. God, I don't understand, but I'm going to keep going. God, I can't see how you could do it this way, but I'm still going. God, I'm miserable in my own skin but I'm trusting your plan is greater than my plan. You know what Satan does? He loves to try to change your plan. He wants your plan 
to lead you to what you think is going to be happiness, but he wants to destroy you. The second thing we see today, if I'm not willing to change my position to align with God's word, I'm choosing not to be teachable. If I'm choosing not to be teachable, I'm asking God to just forget it. My deal's off. Number three. Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, God Himself, the one that the Lord sent from heaven to earth to give us power to live and power and strength to serve, the one that gives us victory in the night, the one that gives us words unspeakable that we need, the one that gives us comfort when everybody else says the wrong things, the Holy Spirit can say the right things, the Holy Spirit of God that was there in Genesis 1 and 2 where it said the Spirit moved over the waters and it hovered and it brooded like a mother hen over her baby, the Holy Spirit, the very one that was there that anointed Saul. The one that was there that anointed David. The one that was there that gave Samson the strength when he needed it most. The one that anointed Jesus when he came to his baptism. And when the anointing came on him by the Holy Spirit, it said he was led by the Spirit from that day forward. He went to the wilderness. He overcome Satan in the wilderness. And at the cross, it was the Holy Spirit of God that held him on those nails. It was the Spirit of God that was at work. And until that moment, that Jesus had to release his spirit and his father had to look away because Jesus had to pay the price of sin. But it didn't end there because when Jesus came back, he spent 40 days with us on earth. And while he was still here, he was showing them the nail prints and showing his hands about what he did. And when he got finished doing that, he said, listen, I will not leave you alone. He said, I'm going to the father, but you will not be comfortless. He said, you will know I'm at the father because he will send the Holy Ghost upon you and you will receive power and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Then he came down in Acts 2 to the Spirit of God. He came and he filled them. They began to speak with other tongues and they began to witness. It said 4,000 got saved. It said another thousands of people got saved and then it was the Spirit of God that gave the church the heartbeat. The reason the church has a heartbeat today is because the Spirit of God descended. And how does the Spirit of God work? He comes in the lives of the believer. And the church can have the heartbeat of God because we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul tells us that we are to walk in the Spirit. So we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our flesh is going to lust against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary. But if we be led of the Spirit, we're not under the law. When you live by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law. You are set free. And the Holy Spirit spirit is the one that gives us direction to follow the plan of God because of this he's necessary because our plans that we make my plans my plans are not good enough but his plans will take you all the way home I want you to give him a hand clap of praise let's stand up let's all stand just close your eyes